my name's Jenny and behind the camera there that's Kitty. Hello! And we're the naturalist interns here at the Arboretum. And for today's video we want to talk about prehistoric plants because here in the Arboretum we have a collection of some amazing species and some of these species were around when dinosaurs walked the earth million and million and million years ago and I just think that's amazing. So we're gonna visit a couple of these species today, show you what they are, where they are, and tell you a little bit more about them. So hopefully if you get a chance to visit our Arboretum, then you also know to keep an eye out for these amazing plants. And we don't have very far to go because our first plant is actually just right behind us. So why don't we get a little closer? So the trees behind me right now, these are all ginkgo trees and these trees are amazing. You can even see they look really weird. Their leaves are arranged kind of weird with all the veins coming out from the um, base of the leaf and they're this beautiful fan shape. And these are really unique as a tree. They're the only species in its genus. And other species in its lineage were found in the fossil record 270 million years ago. So these guys are old, they were around when dinosaurs roamed the earth. And for the last 250 million years, they've basically remained unchanged, which I think is amazing. It's really cool though, because if you ever are near some ginkgo trees, you'll notice that the female trees will actually produce when it's fruiting season, produce these little yellow plums and they fall to the ground and interestingly enough not a lot of animals will eat them and that's because you'll find out if you're close enough that these fruit produce a really rancid horrible smell and that really deters a lot of um, potential animal dispersers out in nature they don't want to eat this because it smells disgusting and the reason for this is these plums these fruit were actually evolved to uh, make use of decomposers as a disperser. So way long time ago in the past, dinosaurs, these scavenging dinosaurs, were actually the main decompose or the main dis seed dispersers, I should say, of these guys. So they'll come along, they'll smell this fruit, it smells like rotting meat, and being decomposers, these dinosaurs would eat these fruit up, go somewhere else, and poop the seeds out elsewhere in a nice fertilizing pile of manure and then you have new ginkgo trees. Now nowadays we don't really have scavenging dinosaurs around. Instead in China where these guys are native to they are mostly distributed by things like civets um, and other small mammalian meat eaters um, but for a while because they lost their main decomposer they actually did very poorly in the wild. Their population kind of dwindled and dwindled and dwindled until they were reduced to a small population in eastern and central China. Um, but they have since made a comeback because they were discovered by people and they've become really popular as a street tree, as an ornamental plant. And also in certain places, their plums, the fruit that they make, are eaten as a delicacy and the nuts inside as well. So these guys have made a bit of a comeback with some help from humans. But next time you see one, maybe even in the streets, definitely have a closer look because they're an amazing living relic that you can see right here today, which I think is super cool. Yeah, and this tree is actually an example of an ecological anachronism. Why don't you tell the folks at home what that means? Yeah, for sure. So an ecological anachronism is when two species have co-evolved together to form a basically a partnership. Um, and with the ginkgo trees, that's a partnership with those scavenging dinosaurs. Those dinosaurs disperse the seeds for this tree. Now, over time, if one of those species in that partnership goes extinct, like those dinosaurs did, then whatever trait that's co-evolved the remaining species is now obsolete. You know, those fruit that smell like rotting meat is no longer very palatable for a lot of the remaining potential animal dispersers. So this adaptation is no longer adaptive. It doesn't really have any use anymore. Uh, so that's basically what an ecological anachronism is. And if you're looking actually to learn a little bit more about ecological anachronisms, definitely go back a couple of weeks in our videos. You'll find them on our YouTube channel um, and check out our video on ecological anachronisms and see some other examples you might find around, which I think is kind of fun. All right, now this is not the only prehistoric plant we have in the Arboretum, so I think maybe I'll pass it on over to Jenny and we'll bring you to see some other ones. 
We've got other things in store for you guys. Yeah, so we're just gonna take a couple of steps this way and take a look at another plant. Now we're gonna stop right here and take a look at this really funky looking curvy vine here. Now this plant is called Dutchman's Pipe. It has these beautiful heart-shaped leaves all over. Uh, although its name actually comes from its flowers. Now I don't see any flowers on the vine right now, but they have these really cool shaped flowers that look a little bit like a pipe and they're mottled in dark red color and they're designed to help attract a very specific type of pollinator. Now these guys are actually going to be attracting pollinators that are not bees but flies especially flies that like to lay their eggs on dead and rotting, decaying meats. Because once those eggs hatch, then their larvae, the maggots, have lots of delicious food around for them to eat. So what happens is the flowers for this Dutchman's pipe, it's colored all blotchy and dark red, kind of like rotting meats. And it doesn't smell too great either. It's not like one of those lovely smelling flowers like lilacs or anything like that. It smells really, really bad. So maybe an unsuspecting fly will come along and get tricked into thinking that it's a piece of rotting meat. So it's gonna go down there looking for a place to lay its eggs. Now that's where the special shape of the Dutchman's pipe flowers come into play. Because if that plant goes inside of that flower, this tube-like shape, what happens is it actually can't get back out because on the inside it has all of these spikes pointing downwards. So a fly can't get back out the same way it came. It's kind of like if you drove into a parking lot with all these spikes that won't let you leave until you pay the parking fee. And that's exactly what the fly has to do. It has to pay a fee. So it's gonna rummage around inside that flower looking for a way out. And along the way, it's gonna brush its body all along uh, the inside of a flower and get covered in its pollen. And during this time, it gets the chance to transfer any pollen from other flowers into this flower as well. And once it has gotten pollen out of it, onto the a fly's body, this fresh pollen, somehow the plant knows that. And over time, once this has happened, those spikes on the inside of the flower, they're gonna start to wither away and relax. And eventually the fly, the fly can fly out and escape and go on to hopefully pollinate another flower the same way. So it's really, really unique adaptation that this plant has to help pollinate its flowers, which I think is pretty awesome. Now this, like I said, is a prehistoric plant. This was around in the Cretaceous period, which was uh, around 65 to 145 million years ago. So at the same time that dinosaurs roamed the earth, this plant was around, which is a really, really cool thing, I think, to be standing right beside. So a pretty awesome plant. Now, of course, this is not the only plant we have, so we're gonna take another couple steps further that way and take a look at another one. All our plants are nice and close to each other today, which is nice. All right. So we are here at one of my favorite trees in the Arboretum, this Dawn Redwood. And it's a pretty spectacular tree in of itself. It's a really beautiful tree I think but this tree has uh, been in the fossil record has been found in fossils dating back around 90 million years ago which is pretty cool and for a really long time people thought this tree was extinct they thought that it wasn't even around anymore until in the 1940s, an American explorer actually went to China and discovered a grove of these trees growing right out there in the wild. And this was huge news. Of course, they were not around in North America anymore, but because it was discovered in China, they got brought over and now you can find these guys in nurseries and gardens and even in some people's homes and also right here in the Arboretum, which is really, really fantastic. Now this tree, something really special about this tree is that this is an example of a deciduous conifer. 
Now, those two words are not typically words we will use together very often. When you think of the word conifer, we are talking about trees that produce cones. And one of the most common examples you might think of will be pine trees or spruce trees. And kind of like this tree right here, those pines and spruces, they have these long needle-like leaves and they produce cones and they keep their leaves all winter long. We also call them evergreen trees because they stay green all year long. Now, when we think of the word deciduous though, we are talking about trees that actually lose their leaves during the winter. So if you think of maybe a maple tree, that's an example of a deciduous tree. It's got these big, broad, flat leaves. And in the fall, those leaves turn these bright, beautiful reds and oranges and yellows, and then they fall down. And then that tree, its branches are actually bare all winter long. And that has to do with the fact that because the leaves are so broad, that in the winter time when it's really cold, then losing its leaves helps it to uh, maintain moisture inside the tree so that not as much water and moisture is evaporating from those leaves. So that's why maple tree loses its leaves and we call this a deciduous tree. Now, of course, if you look at the Dawn Redwood here, it has these beautiful, soft, feathery needles. And as well, it also produces cones. So taking a look at this, you might notice the similarities between this and other coniferous trees like pine trees or spruce trees. But unlike those evergreen trees, this is a deciduous tree. That means if you come back in the fall, these leaves and these needles are actually going to change color. They're going to change into a bright, beautiful orange and yellow color, and they're actually going to fall down. And all winter long, the branches on these trees are actually bare. It is a deciduous conifer tree, which is a really, really unique example. So that's what makes this tree, I think, a little bit special, on top of the fact that it existed at the same time that dinosaurs did, which is pretty cool. Now, those are just a few of the awesome trees we have here in the Arboretum. So next time you're out and about, make sure you take a look around and appreciate some of the things that you have right around you. It's pretty awesome and not every day that we can walk right beside things that are around at the same time that dinosaurs did way, way back ago. So I think it's really, really special. And thank you guys so much for hanging out with us again. And we'll see you again hopefully next week.